stress, fear, depression, spiritual warfare. Are you weighted down? Do you need refreshing? Welcome. Welcome everyone to the Warriors for Christ podcast, where we seek to uplift, edify, and encourage you to be light and salt in a dark and tasteless world with your host, Kyle. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Warriors for Christ podcast. I am Kyle. And I am Sam. And we are here today, folks, to go through the Word of God with you. Brother Sam, what does the Lord put on your heart for us to get into in this episode? Uh, We are going to talk about faith versus works. What's the difference? What's the difference between faith versus works? Now, one of the differences, Kyle, is works by itself is a very simple term, but the Bible uses it in different ways. You see, you have works of the law. You have works of the Spirit. Those are two completely different works. Sometimes in the Bible, it talks about works, but referring to one as works of the Spirit. Another time, it's referring to works of the law. Those are two different works. And yet, you'll read it, and it seems like it's, the Bible's contradicting itself. It's not contradicting. You have to discern and distinguish between the two types, which is fairly easy if you back up and you read enough of the passage. So that's what we're going to look at today. Um, and part of that stems from, I had a conversation Actually, I didn't have a conversation. I have a text. I had some uh, text that went back and forth with um, an uncle of mine. And I, I think, uh, uh, you know, he responded with some great passages about uh, Genesis and uh, Galatians because he had been reading those books. So I think today we'll look, at, we'll look at Galatians. We'll probably look at Ephesians. We'll probably look at James. And we'll look at Genesis because it all ties into most people are aware of the faith of Abraham. And, and that's where they get a lot of the basis of faith. It's the works part that a lot of people don't understand. So I think that's what we'll do, and I pray it will be a blessing. I pray that people will open their Bibles and they'll continue along, because uh, this is going to be very insightful and um, it will bless a lot of people. It's going to open some eyes. Well, that's my prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come here before you, Lord, as our humble servants, during doing the will that you have... Uh, place on our hearts. We pray, O Lord God, that today's message, that it reaches through the airwaves, the internet, however it reaches the audience, Lord, that their ears be opened by your Spirit, that their eyes be opened by your Spirit, and that the total Word of God is able to make its way and penetrate through the blocking and the deception of the world that the enemy would try to uh, keep people from freedom and truth. Father, we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So to start off, Kyle, one of the things I want to point out, I, I think a common verse that that sticks into people's minds. I know with me, I, I used to, I had this verse memorized and I would always quote it to people. And uh, it was Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. What a wonderful passage that is, Kyle. By grace, by grace you have been saved through faith. It's by God's grace and it's only through faith that we can receive the promise of salvation. It has nothing to do with ourselves. It's simply a gift of God. Kyle, that's truth. You can't deny it. You can't bend it. You can't change it. That is a fact. But even within that statement, Kyle, there's a lot of things that, have le- that, that are not said that are still open. So the question is, what really does that statement mean? It's not a result, as a result of works so that no man can boast. When you start to look at that, if, if it's my effort, my works, is that something that I can boast? Because it was if I did it, if, if it's my work and my effort, then I could probably boast in it. That's right. But if, if it's not anything that I can do, not my works, well, then I cannot boast. Because as we're going to look through Scripture, Kyle, we're going to see that there are works involved, but it's not our work. That's right. Verse 10, most, most people stop at the now, 8 now, and 9. Now, this is the irony, right? right? We just saw it's not about works. Well, which works? Because what does verse 10 say? For we are his workmanship. Workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Oh, good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Walk in the works. Wow. So, and, and that's, that's a really good point, Kyle. Most people don't even know that verse 10 is there. Now, when you look at verse 10, it makes perfect sense. I mean, most people would say, yeah, we're, we're supposed to follow Christ. We're supposed to walk, follow, walk in his example. So obviously, did Jesus walk in bad works? 
No, he did not. No, he walked in good works. Did he have sin involved with his good works? No. Any bad fruit involved with his good fruit? None. Um, any little bit of leaven in his unleavened bread? None. Uh, nope. It, what about a pinch of darkness in his light? There is no darkness in his light. That's right. So he had truly good works, works of the Father, the works of the Spirit of God in him. So that that's that's pretty easy to see. Now, when you back up, it kind of gives some insight that people don't always fully understand this grace that we're talking about. You see, in chapter 2, in the beginning of chapter 2 of Ephesians, it says, when you were being dead in your trespasses and sins, in which, how did they used to walk in verse 2? You once walked. Oh, you once walked. So these people aren't walking that way anymore. They used to walk that way. And when they walked that way, they were dead. Following the course of this world. The course of this world. Following the prince of the power of the air. And that's Satan. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So when everyone's still dead in their sins, when everyone's still walking in disobedience, the former path, uh, according to the devil, uh, the spirit of the um, of the world or the devil that works in the sons of disobedience, well, then you're in trouble. Notice disobedience. That That's how they used to be when they used to live that that's way. Right. Verse 3, among whom we also once lived in the passions of our flesh. So Paul acknowledges that him and his companions, who have now been uh, baptized and born again with the Spirit of God through the grace of God and faith, they used to live that way. Hmm. So they don't continue in the sin and trespasses anymore? No, they don't. Um, they used to live in the lusts or the desires of the flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, because it's it's it all starts in the mind. Remember the right. thoughts, the heart. We covered that in the previous episode we just did yep. uh, about vain worship. Yep, they used to. And when you still have those things in your mind or in your heart or the desires, you're called what type of a child? Child of wrath. Oh, a child of wrath, just as the rest. You see, there's no difference. Child, the son of disobedience, uh, led by the spirit of the devil, the spirit of the world, darkness, child of wrath. But that's when they used to live that way. And he says in verse 5, when we were dead in our transgressions, we were made alive together with Christ by grace you've been saved. Now, all this, when you get back to it, it's actually talking about God's predestined plan. You see, even when you're dead, even before you were born, um, you were already dead, but yet he made you alive. Uh, before you even came to Christ uh, in God's predestined plan, you've already been made alive. Now, that, that gets into chapter one. Now, we did an episode on this. We did chapter one, and then we did chapter two through five. We put all of it together. If you don't, if, I'm not going to go into depth here because I want to focus on grace versus works. But he says, he raised them up and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ, verse seven, so that in the ages to come, in the future, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us, in Christ Jesus. And so from that standpoint, for by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. And of course, all this was done in the very beginning. Um, just real quick, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And when did he do this? In verse 4 and 5? Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Oh, so before the world was even created, we existed in his foreknowledge, and he did this, that we would be what in verse 5? Predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. And so here you go through, and you read through the chapter 1, it talks about, again, his predestined, you know, to an inheritance and this, and it was already done before we were born. So when, when Christ was raised, we, we were already raised up with him, even though we hadn't even yet been born. Um, even though we are still dead in sin, even though we haven't been born, but we're still dead in sin, he already died for us, and he raised us, us, seated us, seated us in the heavenlies in Christ, so that in the future, when we would come along, he could show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That's right. So all that, for by grace you've been saved through faith. You see, it's actually something that God did before we were even born, which proves it couldn't be because of us. We weren't even yet born. So of course it's grace. It's God's plan of redemption before we even existed, other than we exist in his foreknowledge, uh, which, he, which he discusses. So from that standpoint, yes, it's only what God does. The question is, how do you receive this grace through faith? What is the result of it? What does the grace of God do? Now, I'm not going to go so much into that today of, of 
what it does and, and all that. We did an episode on that, uh, the, the grace of God, the true grace of God stand for a minute. Um, but we are going to break down here and look at the faith versus works. So again, in verse 10, it's not our works. However, we are created for good works, which the Father created beforehand that we're to be walking in them. So it's key that we go and say, okay, what's this difference between this works that we're supposed to be walking in, which is separate from our works? So I just want to put that out as a background. Now, why don't we flip over to James chapter 2. James chapter 2 is a controversial passage. We're going to look at that because that's going to cause us to dive back into Genesis and then Galatians. And we'll probably go in that order. And we did do a separate episode on James chapter 2. We covered some of this before, but, um, and even all these, some of these passages are going to sound familiar, but we're going to just focus and bring all these together with faith for faith versus work. So in James chapter two, it's important as we get into this from background, uh, remember James chapter one starts off with say, asking whether or not you have a proof of faith, um, then talks about those um, who are deceived. They need to stop being deceived because they're, they're hearers and not doers. And they have the anger of man, some of them, and that they need to get rid of all filthiness and wickedness and humility, receive the word and planted, which can save their soul. And that's all through verse 19 through uh, 22. And you got, they got to become doers because they're deceived. They're deceiving themselves. They're still hearers. And again, you know, talks more about that through the end of the chapter. That's chapter one. So now we go into chapter two. Now it's important. It's not going and being a doer just by your own efforts of being a doer. That, that's not faith. There has to be a change. You know, this is talking about the perfect man, which was discussed earlier in the beginning of chapter one. That's also discussed in Ephesians chapter four, the perfect man, uh, the man who's attained to the same measure, statue of fullness of Christ himself. That's discussed in Ephesians chapter four, like around verse 13. And contrasted between the perfect man and the stained old man in Romans six, seven, and eight. That's right. So now we get into this, this dialogue in chapter two on faith versus works. Um, good discussion in the beginning about, you know, if you're, even if you're showing partiality between how you treat people, it says then you're still sin- sinning and you're convicted law, you're convicted um, by the whole law. Uh, and it's important to understand because, right, it's this sin that we have to get rid of. And that's discussed in, in, in James chapter one and James chapter three. And you have this middle part here where we get into faith versus works. And, and right before that, in chapter 2, again, he talks about a man who shows partiality, showing preferential treatment to the rich man over the poor man. He says, you dishonor the poor man. And he goes on to say in verse 8, if, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, then you're doing well. But in verse 9, if you show partiality, you're committing sin. If you commit sin, you're convicted by the law as a transgressor. Now, it's not just one sin. If you're convicted of one sin, you're convicted of all, because sin is sin. That's right. Verse and, 10, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Yeah. So people say, oh, but I'm not in a murder. I'm not an adulterer. I'm like, well, actually, if you have the thought, then you are. But even if you don't have the thought, you still are if you have other sin, because sin is sin. If sin dwells in the heart, then you're guilty of everything. You know, again, he who said, do not commit a mul- do not commit adultery in verse 11 says, do not commit a mur- murder. If you do not, do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, well, you're still a transgressor of the law. You're guilty of it all. And it goes on later in James chapter four that says, you know, if you have bitterness and selfish, je- jealous, you know, ambition in your heart, don't be deceived. You have all evil inside of you. If you have one, you have it all. But again, that's the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of man. Now, faith versus works. What does it say about faith versus works in verse 14 of chapter 2? What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? And of course, as you keep reading, you find out the answer is no. But he doesn't really tell us exactly what works he's talking about here. He just says works. Now, as we keep looking down, he says, he gives example, hey, if you have a brother or sister without food or clothing... Um, and they have need, and you say, go in peace, be warm, be filled, but you don't give them what, what they need. What good is that? So verse 17, what does he say about faith if it has no works? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Being by itself. It says it's dead. Yeah. That's important to notice. You could have somebody who doesn't have faith, think of the atheist, okay? The moral atheist doesn't have faith, uh, but they give to the Red Cross. Uh, They go and they help people who are in need. They get convicted by that. uh, And they they go and give them food and clothing. So in a sense, you could say, well, don't they have works? But they don't have faith. 
they actually say God doesn't exist. They're a moral atheist. Kyle, does that mean you can reverse engineer and now say, well, they have works, so it doesn't matter that they don't have faith. Um, they're going to go to heaven because they feed the poor and they clothe the poor. It's a very funny and interesting question. It's like reversing the verse there. Works without faith, is it dead? I would say yes. Well, yeah, because if you deny God, then obviously, you know, the Bible's clear. The the reason why I bring that up is you have to read everything. You also have to understand what's the argument being made. And this is going to be key when we get get to Galatians. It's going to be really key. If you don't understand what argument's being made, then you you risk interpreting it and drawing a false conclusion, just like I gave that example here. With, with the faith and works. This is really important. It, the same thing happens in Romans, Kyle. People go into Romans chapter 17, verse 13 to 25, and they draw a false conclusion because they only take part of it and they don't take the whole thing of what's the context of what's being discussed. What is God proving to answer? So here, as we keep reading, he says, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. So faith has to have something else with it. Now, the question is going to come, what comes first? You see, when you actually look at faith versus works of the law, when we get into Galatians, you're going to find that works of the law and faith, it's all about obtaining something. And we're going to find out it's the Holy Spirit. You cannot receive the Holy Spirit of God, the gift of God, by doing your own works of the law. The gift of God discussed in Romans of the Spirit of God, the gift of righteousness, can only be obtained through faith. Amen. The question is then, what does it then produce? Produces good works. Now, now we're going to get into the faith of Abraham, and then we're going to go to Abraham, and we're going to follow this story. We're going to go from here to Genesis and then to Galatians. And, and as we follow this, again, you have to look at the passages in the context of what's being discussed. So, in, in verse 18, still in James chapter 2, he says, But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So now he seems to be contradicting two people. You're going to have a man who says, I have faith, and another man who says, yeah, but I have works. And he's going to go back to the first man with faith. Well, show me your faith, and he's implying that his faith has no works. And then he says, I'm going to show you my faith by my works. Not that he doesn't have faith, but the proof. The proof. Because again, the whole point of uh, James when it started off was, do you have a proof of faith? Now, if people want more of an understanding, we did an episode on each of these chapters in the book of James, I, I please, I implore you to listen to them because if you don't, that's what leads to people drawing false conclusions because they didn't understand the context leading up or the reinforcement if you keep reading. Now, in both cases, both people believe in who? You believe that God is one, you do well, even the demons believe and shudder. So now we have a condition where it's not like he's not saying the person doesn't believe in God. He just believes that God is one. They believe God is one, but it's like, okay, uh, the demons also believe. And it almost makes an implication that they actually fear God, whereas some people don't really have a true reverent fear of God. We just covered um, don't fear death, but fear God. And there is a reverent fear, and, and it also says what the fear of the Lord is and what it does. Amen. Most people don't know. And we covered that That's in those right. episodes. Three episodes. Three episodes. I think some people think there's only two. Somehow a lot of people are skipping the part two. They're going part one to part three. Um but yeah, there's a lot of truth in there. We go through scripture. So here, he, he acknowledges that there's even demons that believe in God, but I, I assure you the demons aren't going to be in heaven. So there has to be something beyond just belief, beyond just faith, can't not just be works of the law. We know that works of the law cannot save. So what exactly is this mystery? Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? So now most people would agree. He's like, listen, if you don't have any evidence of your faith, then then how could you have a true faith? Now, most people would agree that statement. Now, most people are going to be shocked and really start to scratch their head and not understand in the next verse, verse what? 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? So now he's saying Abraham was justified by works. Now, wait a second, Kyle. I thought the Bible says he was justified by faith. Now, all of a sudden, are we saying he's justified by works? It almost sounds like the Bible's trying to contradict itself and create arguments. Well, we're going to go and look at that. But he says he was justified by works when he offered up Isaac on the altar. Now, does that statement say Abraham didn't have a faith? 
No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Now, even up above, it says that the person has faith. It even says above, it says, well, some people believe. The problem is some people's faith and belief, as implied when we read from verse 14 to verse 19, is that some people have a faith in God and a belief of God. One leads to salvation and the other one doesn't. That's right. One leads to salvation, one doesn't. So it seems like he's trying to point out what's the difference between the faith that leads to salvation and the faith that doesn't lead to salvation. This is important, very important for people to understand. But most people become contentious and try to make it black and white, and they don't actually look to Scripture of what Scripture actually is saying and what it is not saying. You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. Ah, so faith was working with his works. So it wasn't that the man who has works didn't have a faith. It's that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, the faith was was perfected. That's right. So you have the faith was perfected as a result of the works. Okay, well, this is interesting. Uh, That may provide some insight where some people have a faith, but they have no works. Now, Kyle, I know as we've, we've covered in the true grace of God and what it does, it produces something. It's, there's a proof of, the, of your faith, as discussed in James chapter 1. If you go through and read, it talks about how you can become a doer, not a hearer, how that you can uh, bridle your entire tongue, and as you keep reading verse 3, not just your tongue, but your entire body, and be the perfect man. Now, these aren't my words. These are the words that are used in both chapter 1 and chapter 3, and it contrasts that with a man who stumbles in many ways— who still has demonic wisdom versus the pure wisdom of God as you keep reading chapter 3 of James. So so again, I know I'm taking all this in the right context because I know both the beginning and the end in the middle of the book, I'm not just plucking and taking things out of context. But that's what the other people do, Kyle, because they don't understand the full context. They just jump in, draw conclusions. They don't even spend time to read the whole chapter or understand what the chapter is saying and what it's not, nor do they understand what's before it and what's after it to see if it answers or reinforces the questions that are already established in God's Word. Amen. That's what they're doing. So, do you see that faith without works, or that faith was working with his works as a result of the works the faith was perfected? So there has to be some work. Now, as we're going to find out later in Galatians, the works that are being discussed are works of the Spirit. It's spiritual work, spiritual fruit. You can have all the faith that you want, but if it's not a true faith that doesn't result in spiritual works, spiritual fruit that only produces one kind, then it's a faith that cannot save. Amen. It's a belief that has no power. Now, the next verse. This verse speaks volumes. Hmm. Most people don't even draw the truth that's being proclaimed in this next verse that we're going to see when we go to Genesis about truly understanding what was the faith that Abraham had. A prophecy. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And And he was called a friend of God. So scripture was fulfilled. Okay, when it says Scripture was fulfilled, that means Scripture was made as a statement of prophecy, and it wasn't fulfilled until some future point. Kyle, what was the Scripture that was spoken as prophecy that it claims was spoken in prophecy in verse 23? And the Scripture was filled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So the specific Scripture we're talking about— I'm getting it from the— the Is Abraham believed God, and and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, or credited to him as righteousness. This is Genesis chapter 15, 15, verse 6. Genesis 15, yep. Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. It's the same passage that's quoted in Romans. When you go to Romans, and it talks about faith there. Romans 4, verse 3. That's right. You find it in Romans chapter 4 as well, and we're going to find it in Galatians chapter 3. That's why we're just going to go to Galatians, because Galatians has the more comprehensive discussion. It captures um, everything in, in a much shorter passages. In Romans, you got to read like five chapters to get the full understanding. Most people don't have the bandwidth or or the mental focus to do that. So we're going to use Galatians instead. But you get the same story out of of Romans. And if people are willing and listen uh, to the episodes, go from Romans chapter one all the way through about Romans chapter 10, and you'll get the full picture. And we've also done the same thing chapter by chapter in the entire book of Galatians. But today we're just going to focus on Galatians because it's much shorter and to the point, and hopefully people will have the attention span. And th- like I said, this is life and death, Kyle. This this is whether or not you have a proof of faith or you don't. So 
Scripture was fulfilled. That means when the statement that was made to Abraham, that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, it wasn't fulfilled. It was a statement of advance. You mean he really didn't believe? And now people are starting to have the right questioning attitude. And that's what we're going to go find out. As a matter of fact, Abraham did not have a perfected faith until he went to offer his son. Amen. It was perfected with his son being off- offered um, as a sacrifice. And we're going to go back and recount that story, and we're going to show people all the clues and everything that the God's Word reinforces this story. So in verse 24, he then says, how is a man justified? Sorry, I'm in a, I was over in Galatians. Oh, yep. So James chapter 2, verse 24, you see that a man is justified by works. And not by faith alone. And not by faith alone. But you'll have pastors and other people go up there and say, it is by faith and faith alone. I'm like, well, I only know of one verse in the Bible that uses that phrase, faith alone. And yet people say you are only justified by faith alone. And yet the only verse that I can find that uses the phrase by faith alone says the exact opposite. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, does this statement say that you are justified by works and not by faith? No. No. It says it's just not by faith alone. It actually implies that there has to be a faith. And there has to be a works. And there has to be a works. So it's not saying that there's no faith, but it's saying that it's clearly saying you can have a faith that cannot save. You can have a belief that cannot save, a belief in God, a faith in God. The question is, how do you make sure that faith and belief in God does result in salvation? How do you make sure that it does result in justification? Now, interesting, these words that are being used, justified or to be uh, righteous, it's the same word that's used in Romans chapter 6 of how you can be justified in the sight of God. And Romans 6, chapter 6, again, it's go- all this, it all says the same thing, but we aren't going to cover that part today. We have other episodes. We're, we're just going to go through the passages that we, we already talked about. So, a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. That's consistent with verse 21. Abraham, our father, was justified by works. But you have to have faith. It actually starts with faith. And that's what we're going to find when we go backwards. It all has to start with faith. So now let's, um, well, let's, let's read the rest, verse 25 and 26, and then we'll go to Genesis. Okay. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So again, Rahab the harlot was justified by works. So we've had this statement like three times now. Now, people can argue with the statement. I'm I'm telling you, don't argue. Ask and pray for God to open your eyes and give you spiritual discernment and understanding in the ways of God so you can understand how is this statement true? What is it actually saying? A person is justified by works but there has to be a faith. So you have to have a faith and then a work. The work really comes down to it. It's the proof of the faith as James, as the whole book of James started with. Are you a hearer or are you a doer? Are you the person who's deceived himself, who hasn't received the perfect gift of God and the person who still has the anger of man, the person who still has not received the word implanted, which is able to save your soul? This is what's discussed in chapter one. That person's commanded they still have to receive it. So just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Now let's go back. Let's look at Genesis and then it will culminate in Galatians. Genesis chapter 15. Now, what's interesting to note is even before Genesis chapter 15, God called Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. As a matter of fact, God told Abraham to leave his country, his relatives, his father's house. Go to a land that I will show you, verse 2, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went forth as Yahweh had spoken to him and lot with him, and Abraham, or Abram, I keep saying he hadn't had his name changed yet, so Abram, was 75 years old. And Hebrews talks about he had faith when he went out. So Abraham had faith when he went out, but was his faith perfected? Not yet. No. Uh, there was, was a his, part of it was in the his, sense that he was obedient in the act of, of going where the Lord sent him. Uh, was his faith credited to him as righteousness? Not yet. 
right? That's the key. It was a prophecy. And we're going to see that in Genesis. As, as a matter of fact, even in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, his faith was still not credited to him as righteousness. Now, people are probably getting confused right now. I said, well, I, I liken it to this. You see, there's a such thing as an infant in Christ. Now, we covered it in Galatians. We'll probably touch on it a little bit. If you go through and you read and you study it, uh, as Paul teaches in Galatians, the infant in Christ is the person who has not yet received the Holy Spirit. Well, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, Kyle, can you produce spiritual fruit, spiritual works? No. Oh, so as we covered in the previous episode, uh, Vain Faith, and in God Requires a New Heart, Part 1, New Testament passages, until you have a new heart, you're still defiled. You cannot bear any good good fruit, even though it looks like it. Your fruit is no different than the fruit of atheists, moral atheists who do a good, good, good fruit. Help your neighbor, feed the poor, do this. Good, good for you. Uh, read those... Acts 18 uh, and 19, where Apollos uh, taught taught uh, the ways of the Lord, was knowledgeable in the scriptures, and pe- many people believed. Yeah, we, Paul came into town. And that's the episode of you must believe and receive the Holy Spirit, I believe, and we covered it in that. Amen. So the whole point is, is when we're called and we start seeking God and we have a desire and a hunger and a longing to be with God, in faith, we walk towards God because we, we, something's causing us to believe. But until we receive the Holy Spirit, until we become a son— and receive sonship through the Holy Spirit, we're still the infant in Christ. And that's what people don't understand because you have many churches. I used to go to one of them. I used to preach and teach the same stuff that, oh, it's it's a journey. You start as an infant. You go to a youth, then an adult. Well, there's some, there's some truth in a certain context of that, but from the context of you don't have the Holy Spirit until uh, you become a son, sonship. The infant in Christ is bad if you stay there and you never progress. Um, it's good from the standpoint if that's just the transition as you go through it, because everybody has to go through that. Yeah, and so, I think you touched on that very well. And uh, don't be like the disciples before they got the Holy Spirit. Okay. So here we are. Abraham had a faith. He had a faith of standpoint. He's like, wow, God appeared to me. Okay, there's got to be something here. So he went forth. But he didn't fully understand everything. And we're going to find out that even though it says later in Genesis chapter 15 that he believed it was credited to him as righteousness, as we know from James, he still did not have a perfected faith. And we're going to prove that using God's word, and not speculation, but using God's word. So let's let's flip over to, you know, it has stories about Lot and Abraham all, all up into here, but we're going to jump to 15, where you get to Genesis 15, 6, where he says, then he, referring to Abram, believed in Yahweh, and he reckoned or credited it to him as righteousness. Okay, this is a statement. Now, now what happened here? So he's already called him to come out. In faith, he came out, but his faith yet wasn't perfected. Um, and he says that God spoke to him in verse 1. And what did he tell Abram in chapter 15, verse 1? In chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. So he wants to give him a great reward. And in verse 2, what does Abraham say? Like, how am I supposed to get a reward? O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Hmm. So Abraham acknowledges that he has no child. And so what does he say? Again, he reinforces it in verse 3. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. All right, so there it is. God told Abraham, or Abram, I'm going to bless you. Not only am I going to bless you, but you're going to have a son that's going to come from your own body. It's not going to be uh, a servant that's in your house, Eliezer the Damascus. Nope, it's not going to be him. It's going to be somebody from your own body. They're going to be your heir. And so Abraham, when God told him that, uh, Abram, I keep saying Abraham, Abram, it says, then believed in Yahweh and he credited to him or counted it to him as righteousness. Now that statement was a prophecy. It didn't actually happen right here. And you're like, yeah, but it says he believed. Well, he believed, but he didn't have a a true belief. He didn't have a perfected belief. What we're going to find out later is he'd actually, Abraham didn't really understand the statement. He really didn't believe. 
and we're going to point that out later. So his faith still hadn't been perfected. It was still a faith where you're being tossed here and there, just like discussed in Ephesians chapter 4. The perfect man who's come to the full measure of stature which belongs, belongs to Christ, the same fullness of deity that Christ had that was discussed in Ephesians chapter 3, and, and then also contrasted versus the infant um, that he's no longer to be, uh, which in verse 14 of chapter 4 is the one who's tossed by waves, uh, driven about by every wind of doctrine, by the cr uh, craftiness of man and his trickery, uh, because they can't find truth, because they keep getting deceived by all this stuff. Well, of course, they're still an infant and haven't found the word of God and the spirit of God, because they, they can't even be grounded on, on what the truth is. But we cover all that in the book of Ephesians. So here, we're going to move forward and say, okay, so what happened and, and where does it really show in here that he, real, he, he still didn't truly believe God, even though it says he believed him? Well, the key all comes as we move forward in chapter 16 and 17. Now, in chapter 16, real short, what ends up happening is, you know, this passage here, this was like, a, you know, he was 75 years old. He goes, and after he lived 10 years, and chapter 16, verse 3, what does he do in verse 3, 10 years later? So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went in to Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Okay, so Abraham has a son. Now, remember, in chapter 15, he says, you're going to have a son from your own body. Did he say from Sarai's body? Nope. No, he said from Abraham or Abram's body. So Abram ends up having a, a son with the handmaid, Hagar. And was that his works or was that God's works? Well, I think that was his works. He he did, he pursued that on his own. Yeah, and, and, and he did it. Uh, was there any supernatural conception involved here? No. It doesn't say it. It, it looks like it was just him, his wife, and the, and the maidservant. And through his own effort, he went in and he got a son from his own body. This is key. This is key for people to understand. There's a difference between works of man and works of the Spirit. Now, again, Abraham, Abraham we're going to find out that he believes he's fulfilling the promise. He believes he's fulfilling the statement of, I'm going to be blessed through my son Ishmael. Remember, the statement, he believed in God, and it was counted or credited to him as righteousness, that was a statement of prophecy. He still didn't truly believe. He had some faith, but not a full surrendered faith of a belief in God that can bring salvation, just as it said in James. We keep reading to find out. Now, some people are like, oh, you're, that, I, I can imagine if my brother was here, he'd be saying, oh, that's your interpretation. That's your interpretation. I said, you're right. Until we read the word, you could make that claim. But once we finish reading God's word... Your words are empty because God's word trumped them. Now, as we continue now to chapter 17. So again, eight, well, uh, right before that, chapter 16, verse 16, just so we have a timeline. How old was Abram when Ishmael was born? I don't recall. I, I slipped over to uh, Genesis 17. Okay. It says, Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael. So 75 years, right, he, ca he, he came out. Um, he left the land. He had, he had a faith of belief to leave, but not a perfected faith. Um, then God says, I will uh, multiply you. And so, you know, 10 years later, he goes, takes the handmaid. Now 11 years, he's born. So he's 86 years old. Now after that, in chapter 17, verse 1, after that, so now he's 99. So Ishmael's like 13 years old. What happens? When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Oh, now this is interesting. Now we have a conditional promise. And a lot of people don't even realize this conditional promise. God commands Abraham that he must do something. Walk before me and be blameless. Wow, we've covered a lot of that in the New Testament. God commanded Abraham to walk before him and to be blameless. And then he says, and I will establish my covenant between me and you. And you're going to see this repeated several other times, that God makes it very clear that it was conditional. Now, most people, when they point to the faith of Abraham, 
They don't even know these stories. They don't know these passages. They go right to Genesis 15, 6 and say, see, Abraham believed God and his credit to him as righteousness. I'm like, okay, that statement was prophecy. It wasn't fulfilled. Abraham had a faith that wasn't perfected. It could not save. Go read Genesis or, you know, James chapter 2 and then come back and read here. So here he says, you still have to walk before me and be blameless. It's a requirement. Now, as we keep reading, people say, yeah, I think you're kind of twisting those words a little bit. Well, Walk bear with me. Walk me and be blameless. But even so, when we're going to keep reading forward, it's going to be very clear as you keep reading. We're going to read all the way there through and covered up to Genesis chapter 15, 26, some key passages that people don't even know exist. Now, he goes through, he says he's going to establish his covenant with him forever as a, as a lasting covenant. Um, and in this covenant, right, he tells him in verse 4, that what does God say he's going to do for him? Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. Ah, so now he's going to change his name to Abraham. Now he's changing his name. And he says he's going to be a father of nations. Now, before... uh, when you when you look back in chapter 12, he told him in verse 2, I will make you a great nation. I will make you a great nation. Now he adds a little bit more to it in chapter 17, verse 4. He says, I will make you the father of many nations. Abraham means father of many nations. Many, which makes sense why God now changed his name. No longer shall your name be Abram, but it'll be Abraham, for I will make you a father of many nations. And we know that this is going to come through the promise, which we're going to discuss more in Galatians. So now he makes this promise with him, and then he tells him, and this is key, this is really key here. He says he's also going to change the name of his wife in verse 15 and 16. What does he say he's going to change the name of his wife to, and why does he say he's going to change her name? And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Okay, so she's going to become, um, you know, from her, right, the son. He's going to give her a son, and... um, she shall be a mother of nations, and kings of people shall come for her. Come from her. So God just told them, right? Because God wants to establish His covenant with Abraham, and He says that this covenant that He's going to establish with Abraham, it's actually going to come through a son. But the son it's going to come through is from Sarah. Sarah. Mm-hmm. So God has now told him how He's going to fulfill the blessing. Remember, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, but it was a statement of prophecy because it hadn't been fulfilled. Did Abraham believe God when he, God says, this is how I'm going to do this blessing? Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? Okay, so wait a second. So God told Abraham before he was going to bless him through a son. Abraham went and had a son Ishmael through his own effort. Mm-hmm. Now God says, no, it's going to be through Sarah. God, so Abraham doesn't believe initially? He fell on his face and laughed. He actually laughed in the presence of God? Yep. He laughed at what God told him. And then very much questioned it. Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? So he laughs at God's statement. Then he says, how can this be effectively? Yeah, he questions I'm it. too old. Sarah's too old. It's not possible. Wow, that faith. Hmm. But but God but but God said it. But that would require you to have faith in that what God says is true, faith without doubting. The one who doubts is like the surf of the Double sea. Double minded. Double minded will not receive anything. Remember, Abraham had not yet received a perfected faith. He had faith in God, but he doubted it hadn't been perfected. He didn't fully understand. As a matter of fact, he laughs. He says, it's not possible. And then he doesn't stop there. He He goes back to God. He wants to change the plan. He wants to change the promise because he doesn't believe God has the power to do it. Oh, that Ishmael might live before you, he says in verse 18. So now Abraham wants his other son, who was conceived through the work of the man, not the work of the spirit, to do it. 
because the problem is Sarah's womb was closed. Uh, can the Spirit of God open a womb? Yes. Oh, but for someone whose womb is closed and has, was not able to have ch- child, it requires an act of God, spiritual act of God, not by the efforts of man, not by the works of man, so that no man may boast, but by through the work of God through faith. You know, Kyle, it's kind of about being spiritually born again. Every man's born once in the flesh, like Ishmael, but we must be born again to the Spirit of God, where God does a work to open the womb and bears us again anew. It's an impossible work. Most people say, oh yeah, I believe in that. I believe in that. I said, oh, so you've been freed from all sin? You don't live anymore? Well, that's impossible. Oh, you, you want to have the faith like Abraham? Well, then you're never going to come into the promise of God if you want to have the faith like Abraham. That's a faith that hasn't been perfected. <laughs> You'll have a faith that will never be counted as righteousness to you because you doubt. Now I pray people are starting to put all this together and James chapter 2 is starting to make sense. We have a little bit more in Genesis that's going to fully... Uh, establish this truth that isn't being taught. In verse 18 and 19, and, and Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him, with Isaac, for an everlasting covenant, for his descendants after him. Now, he did acknowledge that Ishmael was Abraham's son. He said, as for Ishmael, I've heard you, and I'll bless him, and I'll make him a fruitful and exceedingly multiply and multiply him, and he'll become a father of 12 princes, and I'll make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. So that's important. Now, after this, it appears after this point in time that Abraham is like, okay, Okay, I got it, God. Um, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with this. But now God has to test him. It's, it's kind of like when you go back and he had to test Israel, but Israel filled the test. And we did this, and you know, is your f- faith based upon truth or lies? Part one and part two, when we go through the whole story of uh, Israel and the exodus of Israel out with Moses from Egypt, when he talks about I redeemed my son by the blood of the lamb, my firstborn. And yet then he subsequently destroys them, even though it says they believed in fear of God. And you're like, well, what happened? Well, go listen to those two episodes and find out. Because all these stories all have the same themes, and God put them there for a purpose. Now, in chapter 18, so he appears to him, right, again, and he says, uh, and this is where, you know, the three angels come down. And in verse 9 of chapter 18, they said to him, where's your wife, where's your, uh, Sarah, your wife? And he said, they're in the tent. And he said, I will surely return to you at this time next year. Behold, Sarah, your wife shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age, and Sarah was past childbearing. Now, in this time, does it say Abraham laughed? Hmm. No. Uh, in the very, very next verse there, it says, uh, Verse 12. Yeah. I, I lost my place on my phone. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, No. But you did laugh. Yeah, God knows the truth. Yep. You can try to deny it, but God knows the truth. So it doesn't say Abraham. So it seems like Abraham has passed his disbelief. It seems yep. like Abraham is now, actually, he's believing. And we know from Romans that now at this point he is believed, but now God has to test and prove whether or not he passes the test. Um, and then his faith has been perfected. And then he continued to live in that faith for the rest of his life. So in verse 19 or 18, and this is actually, let's read from verse 17 to 19, because now we're going to find out more about the promise. We're going to find out more about this conditional promise. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Now, listen to that. You see, God. now God knows the future, so God knows what's going to happen. Um, even though we still have free will, that doesn't take away our free will. He can just fast forward the videotape. But he says, he said, 
that his children and his household after him are to keep the way of Yahweh by doing righteousness. See, not a hearer, but a doer. By doing righteousness, doing justice, so that Yahweh might bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. You see, again, it's conditional. It's conditional. Now, flipping over again into chapter 21, we're now going to find out when he went to... Actually, I'm sorry, 22. So Isaac is born, and now he's going to, to take him and put, put him up on the mountain. Why? What does it say in chapter 22, verse 1? After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So God has to test him. Now, again, remember in James, he had to see if he had a proof of faith. When he initially said it in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, it was a prophecy. It had not yet been credited to him. Abraham had a faith, but it wasn't perfected. Abraham still had doubt. He still didn't understand the power of God. When he made the promise that in his seed, you know, the nations of the earth would be blessed, he still didn't understand it. He thought it would be Ishmael. He went and he had Ishmael through his own effort, the works of man, not the works of God. When God then told him it would be through not Ishmael, but through a son through Sarah, he laughed. He laughed at the promise of God because he didn't think it was possible. He didn't have faith in God. He had faith in his own ability, but he didn't have faith in God. He doubted. And it wasn't, and then he tries to change God's covenant plan and says, no, no, let it be Ishmael, not Isaac. God rebukes him and says, no, it will not be. It will be my way. So now as he goes, it, it doesn't say Abraham laughs anymore. Sarah laughed again. He didn't. Again, the conditional promise, if, right, if you continue. And, and so now he has to test him. Has Abraham's faith been perfected? So what does he say in verse 10 through verse 12? Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. So then God goes, he provides another ram caught in the thicket for Abraham to, to sacrifice. And then God speaks to Abraham a second time. And God tells him very important words very important words. And you have to read these very slowly. And, and some of this, one of this is quoted again in Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. What does verse 16 to verse 18 say? And then I'm going to read 15 too. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Now, most people, when we just read that, they probably heard, oh, see, um, he repeats the promise. Verse 18, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. There you go. Verse 17, I will greatly bless you and multiply you as the stars of heaven, right in the stand of the seashore, and in your sea the, you shall possess the gate of your enemies. They're like, yep, yep, I've heard that before. I know that. So, so what's new? I said, well, did you miss again the two conditional statements? Verse 16, because you have done this thing, mm -hmm. because, because you, you have, have obeyed my thing, voice, yep. uh, and you have not withheld your son, indeed, I will now greatly bless you. Mm -hmm. uh, did you miss in verse 18? Uh, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because, because why? You have obeyed my voice. Because he obeyed his voice. Are you seeing the pattern? We've seen this now a couple times. This is the third time. Um, and, and what does he tell Isaac when Isaac is older in chapter 26, when God appear, uh, uh, speaks to Isaac, he tells Isaac in chapter 26, Verse 4 and 5, what does God tell Isaac? I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and will give to your offspring all these lands 
and in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Because Abraham obeyed. Yep. Because Abraham obeyed. He kept his charge, his commandments, his statutes, and his laws. And some people are like, well, what do you mean? I thought the law hadn't been given. Love God and love your neighbor. It's the two greatest commandments that have always existed. You know, we covered this and what does God always require from the beginning? We did an episode on it. New heart. It, it, it's all there. And obedience, obedience from the heart. Mm-hmm. You have to get a new heart and then you walk in the obedience. It's the proof of the faith. Yeah, he fulfilled the law. So now with that, now let's go and let's turn to Galatians. Faith versus works. And I'm going to go right to a passage, Galatians 2.16. Kyle, I used to have this verse memorized. I had this one uh, went right along nicely. I paired it with, with Ephesians 2.8 and 9. Uh, and that was my doctrine, those, those verses, that in the Romans Road. Because I, in ignorant, I knew part of Scripture, but not all of Scripture, uh, just as the devil preaches half the truth, but not the full truth. And I say half, really, he preaches like 95% of it. And Paul warns against it, against the Corinthians, that even though they'd received Christ, the Spirit, and the gospel, that they were being deceived as the serpent deceived Eve to run off and accept a different gospel, a different Christ, a different spirit. Now, if that can happen to people who've already uh, accepted the true gospel, the true Christ, and the true Spirit, well then, and it can happen for them to then turn away from that and accept the false one, as discussed in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, well then, what happens to people that never even heard the true gospel or accepted the true Christ, and they go off and accept the wrong one the very first time. But people don't understand the great danger, even though the Bible warns against this stuff. Now, Galatians. So Galatians chapter 2, again, I had this verse memorized. Verse 16. Can you please read it? Sure. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, so we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. There you go. By works of the law, no man can be justified. Now, uh, to help this make a little bit more uh, sense from a, a comprehensive standpoint, the word justified actually means to be righteous. So, as we keep reading this, because if, if you don't read it that way, it's actually going to be hard to understand when you get into other passages when it explains it. Um, but we're going to go through it. So I'll get to that again. But now I want to back up and give you some context. Context is key. You can make a statement and it can mean completely different things depending on the context and what, what argument God is trying to prove. Now, if you back up, there was a problem in the church of Galatia. You see, something was happening with the Galatians. Something terribly amazing, it was amazing, but not in a good way, a terrible way, was happening. What was happening in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 and 7? Verse 6 and 7. You'll have to go get there. He says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Oh, which really isn't another gospel, but there's some who are disturbing you and are distorting the gospel of Christ. So it's not that they were preaching, they weren't preaching Christ. They're still preaching Christ, but somehow they were distorting it to a point that they were being accused of deserting God. He goes on to say, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached, he is to be accursed. He says it again, as I've said before, so I say again now. So this isn't something that was just a one-time offense. This has happened several times. As I say before, I say again now, if a man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. Now, some people are like, okay, he must be like preaching Buddha or this or, or, you know, star worship or, or some crazy thing. No, they're preaching Christ, a gospel of Christ, but they're distorting it. Just like Paul had to warn the Corinthians, a different gospel, a different Christ, a different spirit that sounds the same, but it's slightly different. Just as he warns, people hold to a form of godliness, but have no power in 2 Timothy. So what was this? What was this danger? Now, it wasn't that they had not received the true gospel. They had. It wasn't that they hadn't accepted it or hadn't been born again or received the true Holy Spirit of God. They had. 
Now, people might say, no, now, now, now most people would agree with me there because they think anybody who's called a Christian or a church automatically has the Spirit of God, even though that's not the case if you go through and read Scripture carefully. But in this case, it is the case, and I know that because of what chapter 3 says. Now, I want to go to chapter 3 because this statement also gives great insight, and these are key statements that you have to understand. If you don't, you mess up all the context of the middle. So I'm covering a little bit of the beginning, a little bit of the end in chapter 3. I'm going to go back to the middle of chapter 2. And then I'm going to go to the end again and cover the whole book in totality to really solidify this as like an iron gate that that you cannot, you know, it's firm. So in chapter three, he's not going to speak kindly to the Galatians. He's actually going to rebuke them. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law? Or by hearing with faith. Now we have to stop right there. That right there gives, it screams the context of what the whole argument is about. And this is going to be repeated as we go along. How did you receive what? The Spirit. This whole argument is how do you receive the Spirit of God? This is not about what does the Spirit of God produce? What does the Spirit of God do? That's later. That's at the end of the book. Okay, the whole initial argument here is, how did you receive the Spirit? It acknowledges that they received the Spirit. He's drawing them back to a conclusion and an argument of how did you receive it? Because they were being deceived and people were telling them other things. How did you receive the Spirit of God? Was it by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Works of the law. Is that how you receive the Spirit of God? Do you try to keep the commandments? And if you can try to keep the commandments or in your attempt to keep the commandments, then God gives you the Spirit of God? Nope, that's the works of the law. That's works of the law. God gives you the Spirit of God through faith. But again, it has to be the true faith. What faith or what are you actually expecting God to do? You see, remember, Abraham expected God to give him a blessing through a son. But the, the, the promise that the faith that he was expecting to give through the son was the wrong son. Was Abraham, would God, would God, did God say he would honor Abraham's faith because Abraham believed it and wanted it to receive the promise through the wrong son? No. God said, absolutely not. Now, if Abraham would have changed his wisdom of man to then believe in the impossible power of God, and he didn't change, Abraham would have never experienced the power of God because God, I guarantee you, God would not have blessed and bring, brought the promise through Ishmael. God, God had already declared it would be through Isaac. That's right. Do you see how this is key, Kyle? Yep. This is so key, and this is what is not being taught. And so I pray, everyone who's listening, remove the lies that you've been taught. Now, some of the stuff is in your head. It's Word of God. Don't throw that out. Keep that. Keep all the other interpretations and the adding and the censoring that has happened. You have to put all Scripture together. You cannot remove one piece from another. And you cannot add something that is not there. How do you receive the Spirit? Is it through works of the law or is it hearing by faith? But it has to have a true faith. A faith in what God says is true, not what you think is Abraham before God corrected him and before his faith was credited to him as righteousness. Again, read the rest of it, Kyle, in verse 3 through 5. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness? That's right. And so it it gets back to be sure that it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Now, remember, it's not the faith of the faith that Abraham initially had. That actually was a faith of works of the law. And yet most of the churches today have the faith of Genesis 15, 6 before it was fulfilled in the state as it was when it was made to Abraham as a statement of prophecy while Abraham had a faith in God that was still a vain faith that could not save, that God would not have fulfilled because Abraham was trusting in his own works of the law through I, uh, through Ishmael. And as we go through the story, he then specifically uses a story about Isaac and Ishmael to show the fallacy. But as we went back earlier, Abraham initially, his faith was that the promise would be through Ishmael. God had to rebuke him. God had to uh, chastise him and say, no. Abraham laughed at God. Abraham argued with God. And it wasn't until Abraham came into obedience of what God says was true, that Abraham was able to then get a perfected faith that could save him. 
And now I pray, people, there are so many people in churches who sit here and have these vain arguments, and they think they're defending something, and they're actually trying to defend the first faith of Abraham that was a faith that could not save, because they do it out of order, and they don't understand that there were two faiths. One faith that had no works of the Spirit, that was a vain faith that had no works, because it was only works of man, which is what Abraham had had initially, and the second faith is a faith that, that requires no work of man, it requires the power of God, but then you have the work of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit as the proof of faith, and that faith is a true faith. So now that we have that, now let's go back and look at this chapter 2. Now, the first statement that he's going to make that most people don't even know that this verse is in the Bible is verse 14 and verse 15. What does chapter 2, 14 and 15 say? But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? And 15. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet okay, we... yep, so that's it. So right now, he's making an argument. See, the problem was Peter, Peter actually stood condemned. Yep. A lot of people don't know that. Peter stood condemned in verse 11, not because it says Peter was preaching false doctrine. Uh, Peter, through his behavior, was actually kind of withdrawing and not hanging out with the Gentiles because of the fear. Showing partiality. Showing partiality. Hey, we covered that in James uh, earlier. Show partiality. You're going to be convicted by the law of a transgressor. God will convict you as a murderer, an adulteress, everything. Uh, So you, you cannot continue in that. He stood condemned until he repented. Now that gets back to God's not going to break you off if you commit a sin. But if you were never freed from sin or you continue in it, well, then you have no hope. Now, notice the statement he makes here. This almost seems contrary. He says, we are Jews by nature and we are not sinners from among the Gentiles. Now, when you look at the statement, that seems to imply that, well, if you're a Jew, then you aren't a sinner. If you're a Gentile, then you are a sinner. Well, now, why would he make that statement? That almost seems contradictory to the very foundation of faith. And I ask people that because until you understand why that's there, you don't understand the question of what God's trying to prove. The point is, he's trying to get across that it doesn't matter how you live. It's not your outward works. It's not your outward life that prove, that, that, that changes your heart. The Jews lived a life outwardly. They didn't have the Spirit of God. Well, some did, but not all of them. Most of them didn't. God destroys most of them. Most of the Jews did not have the Holy Spirit of God. They had not received the Spirit of God through faith. So their service to God was through works of the law, because they didn't have a new heart. So what he's saying is, listen, it doesn't matter if you try to live like the Jews. Um, that cannot save you. That you cannot give the you cannot receive the Holy Spirit through that. Now he acknowledges. He acknowledges that in general, because the Jews tried to follow the law, they were typically a people that was considered a righteous people in the eyes of man. You know, even Jesus said to the the Pharisees, he says, "Listen, in in front of all the Jews, he says, listen, in the eyes of man, the Pharisees are outwardly righteous, but the problem is God sees the heart, and inwardly they're full of death, man. You know, death and decay." So here, outwardly, the Jews, by nature, are not sinners. The Jews had a great and glorious law. They didn't murder. They didn't steal. They didn't covet, at least outwardly. If they did, there were very sharp punishments, even punishment of death. So those people who couldn't control themselves outwardly were quickly put to death. But the problem is, Gentiles who didn't even try to restrain themselves, you would go to a Gentile town, and you could go to a Jewish town, and there was a significant difference in the morality between the two people. Outwardly, you go to the Jews, you're like, wow, these are righteous people. They aren't sinners. You go to the Gentiles, you're like, wow, these are sinners in the eyes of men. So he makes that statement. He says, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles, but it doesn't matter. Now we're getting to the truth. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that outwardly the Jews look like they are righteous. It doesn't matter. Because in verse 16, nevertheless, knowing that a man is, is not, cannot be righteous by works of the law but only through faith in Christ Jesus. Did you catch that? In the eyes of God, you cannot be righteous by trying to do works of the law. That's what the Jews did. In the eyes of men, they appeared righteous, but in the eyes of God, they don't. That's right. Because God looks at the heart. He doesn't look at the outward. But even we believed in Jesus Christ so that we might be righteous by faith in Christ Jesus and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, 
No, no will be man justified. can be righteous. You cannot be righteous by works of the law because works of the law cannot change the heart. The only thing that can change the heart is what, Kyle? God. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that has to circumcise your heart to get a new heart that's discussed in Romans chapter 2. Until you have the new heart, you cannot be righteous in the eyes of God. Now, a new heart produces an inward righteousness and also reflects an outward righteousness. Not an outward righteousness of hypocrisy or where you have sinners, sin, uh, sinful thoughts, which defiles a man. No, it changes everything from the inward out. That's why it has to be by the Spirit. It cannot be works of the law because works of the law cannot change the heart. Now, verse 17, read that one. But if in our endeavor to be righteous in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? So notice what he says. So now he's going to go through the argument to prove, right? He's going to prove why you cannot be righteous by seeking to serve God or trying to please God through your behavior, by trying to not sin, um, through works of the law, as it's called. Well, why is that? Well, verse 17, but if while seeking to be righteous in Christ, because right, a lot of people will go and try to be righteous in Christ. Kyle, before I received the Holy Spirit, even though I thought I'd received the Holy Spirit when I said the prayer with my parents as, as, as a young boy, you know, in elementary school, I was seeking to be righteous in Christ. Now, not that not that I thought that that would save me. I'm like, oh no, I'm saved by faith, but I wanted to serve God. I knew that I'm not supposed to be sinning, right? I'm supposed to be living holy. Ironically, why did I think that if if sin couldn't be removed from me, right? But anyways, it's like it's like the trick. It's it's a trick of the devil. But if while seeking to be justified or be righteous in Christ, I was found to be a sinner, is Christ then a minister of sin? No. May it ever be. So Certainly Kyle, not. my entire life up up to this point, effectively, I was living a life calling myself a Christian. I was seeking Christ, just as it says here in verse 17. I was seeking to be righteous in Christ. Now the problem is I thought I was righteous in Christ, even though I wasn't. And the more I would seek God, the more I would realize that I'm a sinner. As a matter of fact, especially when you get older, you're like, oh man, why do I keep doing the things that I'm doing? Why do I keep thinking the way I'm thinking? Uh, the more I would even read my Bible, I was like, I, I need to read my Bible more. I just need to pray more. I need to draw closer to God so he can, wink, wink, sanctify me. This is when I thought sanctification was a process, and I didn't realize that God proclaims it's an event. Don't worry, we did an episode on that that goes through the Word of God. So even though you may disagree, we go through the Word of God. So if you don't, it, you know, if you continue to hold that belief, you'll realize that you're actually believing contrary to God's Word. But we go through that different episode. The point is here— and, and many of you listening, if, if you haven't received a new heart, you're going to, this is verse 17 you're going to identify with. The more you want to draw closer to Christ, the more you're going to see the sin in your life. The more fervent you read your word and you pray and you meditate and seek to serve God, the more the sin is, the sin is going to stand out like a sore thumb as you're like, wow, why, why do I keep stumbling over these thoughts? You need a new conscience. That's right. The new conscience as what Peter says is baptism in 1 Peter chapter 3. So he then continues in verse 18, right? He's referring to the person who's seeking Christ, but yet is still proving they're a sinner because they haven't received the Spirit. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. That's right. So Kyle, you know, and this, I, this is so clear to me now when I look back, right? When I look back, now that I have the new heart and I look back at my old life, Kyle, I would constantly tear down the things. I'm like, okay, I'm not doing that sin anymore. I'd tear it down. You take things, you get it out of life. You, you delete stuff off your computer, whatever it is. And I'd say, I'm done with that. But Kyle, the problem is I didn't have a new heart. The sin still lived in my heart. And so the temptation actually lived in me. I tempted myself. The sin was living in me. The lusts were inside of me. So sure enough, it was only a matter of time and because it never left in my heart. I, I, I didn't realize that the sin was the problem with sin living in my heart. I was only convicted more so when I did it outwardly. Um, and I'd do it again. And I'd rebuild what I once threw down. And then I'd tear it down again. I'd do it again, tear it down again, do it again. Kyle, for Proved the last 40 years of my life, for the last 40 years of my life, I proved myself to be something. A transgressor. I proved that I was still a transgressor, that I could not stop because the sin lived within me. But, Kyle, then I found truth, and I found Christ. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might now live to God. Well, how did I die to the law, Kyle? I have been crucified with Christ. 
It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that's the key. You see, Kyle, I had to be crucified with Christ. That was the only way I could die to the law so that I could then live to God. A beautiful explanation of this whole process and the result and what happens is the spiritual baptism of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, that's discussed in Romans chapter 6. Please, if you haven't listened to that episode, I beg you, listen to the episode we did on Romans chapter 6. Then go and listen to the next one on Romans chapter 7 and Romans chapter 8, and you'll have a more comprehensive understanding of the true Word of God and what all this means, faith versus works. It's all about how do you receive the Spirit, how are you set free from sin, to then live a life of freedom in the Spirit of God, serving God in holiness with a clear conscience, no longer battling the sin that lives in you, but now warring against the sin in the world around you and warring against the weapons of darkness. That's right. So he says, so now I live in the, so now the life that I live in this body, I now live by faith in the son of God. See, Kyle, before I thought I I was living in true faith, but I wasn't. I was still proving myself a transgressor because I could never overcome. The closer I thought I would try to draw to Christ, the more I realized and saw the sin that lived still in me. But now I live in faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Kyle, in verse 21, I do, I no longer nullify the grace of God. I used to. You see, before I nullified the grace of God because I continued to sin and sin and sin, and I never received it. I made void the grace of God because I did not come in true faith. Just like Abraham had, had was nullifying the promise until he finally came in the true faith yep. and believed in the spiritual truth and not man's truth. Because if righteousness comes through the law or works of the law, then Christ died needlessly. Now, people are still trying to produce righteousness in their life. But the only way people can produce righteousness in their life is to try to live according to rules. Because... When you have the Spirit of God, it's no longer a bunch of rules. It's no longer, oh, I, oh, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Well, the reason why you have to tell yourself, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, is because the sin still dwells within you. You still actually have wicked desires that, that are in you. You're like, why do I still, you know, as a man, why am I still attracted and I lust after other women? Because it's in you. Every man does that. We're born that way. Uh, until God removes your desire and crucifies the old heart and gives you a new heart, new desires, you cannot stop. The only thing that can control it, the only way to try to overcome that and produce righteousness is to, to try to conform yourself to something that you are not. So for that, pe- that person, Christ died needlessly. And then he says again, you foolish Galatians, who has, who has bewitched, bewitched you? Yeah. Yeah. How did you receive the Spirit? Please tell me. Was it through trying? Was it by, oh, I need to do this. I, I need to stay away from that. I need to stop looking at this. I need to stop. I need to stop letting my tongue loose. I need to stop having the anger of man. Can you not see that's works of the law? That's works of the law. That's representative that the, that the that the old man, that old heart, the sinner's heart, hasn't been cleansed and removed. So, so then when you continue, he then talks about the faith of Abraham. Uh, to change your heart and to receive the Holy Spirit of God is nothing about your works, but it's about faith. Now, again, initially Abraham didn't understand, but in verse eleven, and this is in chapter three, no one can be righteous by the law. No one can be righteous by the law because it's evident for the righteous man shall live by faith. Now, you have to live by something. You're living by one of two things, either by the law of man or the law of God, which is through outward convictions to live a moral life, or you're living by faith, which is the spirit of God in your heart. Now, it doesn't really tell you exactly what what it is here, but it explains it in in Galatians chapter 5. Most people just don't keep reading the book to understand. They draw their own false interpretations because they never understood the true faith of Abraham to begin with uh, that we already covered earlier. But we don't need to do that. You see, the law is not of faith. No, on the contrary, the one who practices them shall live by them. Kyle, I had to force myself to try to conform to godliness before when I had sin living in my heart. I had to try to practice doing good. Now, I would have told you it's all by faith. I'm not doing that. No, I'm not doing works of the law. But now looking back, I can see that's exactly what it was. People come to church and they say, listen, guys, you should read your Bible more. Sorry, that's works of the law. Um, guys, you really shouldn't be doing that. You should abs- you should abstain from that. Uh, that another work of the law. Uh, you know, we shouldn't really be doing those sins. Uh, work of the law. It's, it's all works of the law because they have to tell people what they shouldn't be doing. They have to tell people what they should be doing because, and even ourselves, we have to tell ourselves that. Because it's not in the heart. It's not pure, holy, in the heart with all the other things that are contrary to God having been removed and cleansed. Now, all that's a different uh, teaching. Again, go listen to the new heart, part one and part two, and you'll understand that. 
until you listen to that. Sure, you could say I'm speculating, but when you read the word of God, you can't because that's what it says. But the whole point is verse 14. What is the whole point of what we're talking about? Faith versus the works with regards to receiving what? So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. That's the whole argument. The argument is how do you receive the Holy Spirit of God? Do you receive the Spirit through works of the law or do you receive it through faith? That's what it's talking about. Then you have a whole other section of the Bible, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, James, um, all these other books and Romans that talks about whether or not you're producing the spiritual fruit of God, whether or not you're true son of God through works of the Spirit. It's a completely different work. It's, it's contrary to works of the law. So you can't sit there and say, oh no, you're preaching works of the law. No, now I'm talking about works of the Spirit. That has nothing to do with works of the law. Works of the Spirit can only come through a true, genuine faith. And that fulfills the law. That's right. And that gets into the other lesson that we did. The new commandment is the old commandment, and we're commanded to be doers of the law. Once you understand this statement of faith versus works, I pray then listen to the other episode we did so you can go deeper into God's word and understand the full truth. There is the power of God here and a blessing that God wants everybody to have. He does not want anybody to struggle with any sin. There should be no sin dwelling in your thoughts. Now, you can't do it. I can't do it. Only God can do it. But that's the promise. That's the true promise and result of what faith does. And then he gives a great example of Abraham, of, um, you know, Isaac and Ishmael, or Sarah and um, Hagar. So as he keeps saying, he talks about the promise, right? We covered this with Abraham, the promise. Verse 16, chapter 3 still, verse 16. 316. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ, this is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterwards, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. Now, remember, the promise that we're talking about, it's really the promise of faith in God, a promise requires that, or a promise that requires the work of God through the Holy Spirit. Remember, Abraham had two faiths, one that couldn't save them, one that could, mm-hmm. one that was based upon works of the law or man's effort, one that was based and had, had he had to entirely depend on God's spirit to do the, the second one, because he he was now too old and Sarah was barren. That is a faith we're talking about. Do you have faith that God can transform you into somebody who can live and walk as Christ walked? To be filled with all the same fullness of deity of Christ that's discussed and commanded that must happen in the Bible. We cover that in Ephesians chapter 3, as well as in Colossians, as well as in 2 Peter. These are not my words. These are God's words. If these sound foreign to you, you need to get into your Bible and dig deep and pray and beg for God to open your eyes and to teach and to show you. The inheritance is not based upon the law. If it is, it's no longer based upon a promise. God's granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Why did the law come in? The law was, why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. That's right. So everyone shut up under sin. There's only one way to escape sin, and the only way to escape sin is through the Holy Spirit of God. But until you have the Spirit, you're under uh, a tutor. The tutor is the law to show you that you're in trouble. What does it say in verse 23 to 24? Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. That we might be righteous by faith. You cannot be righteous until you get a new spirit to then walk and produce this fruit of God, the spirit, spiritual fruit. Now, he says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, verse 26. Mm -hmm. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Now, for that's those people who have done that. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're Jew. It doesn't matter if you're Gentile. It doesn't matter. It's all the same work. All the same work. You're one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's descendants, heirs according to a promise. The problem is not everybody has reached sonship. Some people are still infants. 
Now, this word, some, some people's words, their Bibles will say child. It's actually infant. It's infant. Now, in chapter 4, verse 1, what does he say about the infant? I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. So the infant. When you're still an infant, you're no different from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything. That's right. Now, God's predestined plan, when he knows who's going to eventually Who's going to be a son up, and who's not. Right? Then, then those who will become a son, then you will be an heir. But there's a many illegitimate children. The Bible talks about that. So what does it mean to be an infant? Well, when you're an infant, you're still under guardians. You're still under managers until the date set by the father. Now, the father knows the date that you're going to be perfected, or at least the first perfect. We talk about that in uh, you know, the, the perfect episode. There's two different perfects that the Bible discusses. Um, the first one is the heart, receiving the Spirit of God. The second one is the resurrection. But in this one here, he says, while we were, in, while we were infants, in verse 3, we were still held in slavery under the elemental things of the world. Oh, this is the person that still hadn't yet been freed. They'll, they the are still a slave. Seven. That's right. They're still a slave. Well, how do you go from infant being a slave to no longer being a slave? But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Uh, adoption as sons. Now, there's a certain thing that God does by the Spirit in the heart. In verse 6, he says, Because you were sons, referring to those who had become sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, referring to these who receive the Holy Spirit, if you have received the Holy Spirit in verse 6, then in verse 7... You are no longer a slave, but a son. And oh. if a son, then an heir through God. So if you receive the Spirit of God, you're no longer this slave or this infant in Christ. Mm -hmm. You now become a son. You now have the Holy Spirit of God. You're now then an heir through God. The but same at Holy that Spirit time, that descended on Christ. That's right. However, at that time, when you did not know God, even though you probably thought you did... You were still slaves to those by which na nature are not gods. But now he says, but now that you've come to know God, or rather be known by God, how is that you are turning back again to these weak and worthless things of the world to be enslaved all over again? Now he's like, oh my goodness, I fear. What's his fear in verse 11? Now these are the people who had already received the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit Kyle. He's afraid. He says, I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain labored over you in vain, he goes on in verse 16, have I become your enemies because I told you the truth? And so then he goes on in verse 19, he says, my children with whom I'm again in labor until Christ is formed, but I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone because I'm perplexed about you. And so now he goes into this argument again, reminding them about Sarah versus um, uh, Hagar, because he's like, you guys are going backwards. Now, we already read earlier in chapter 3, he acknowledged that they had received the Spirit of God. The problem is they're being deceived and they're going backwards. This gets back into, can you lose the Spirit of God? Most people say, no, it's impossible. Now, you're going to see here in Galatians, you're going to be like, well, wait a second, he actually says it will happen. Now, we did an episode on this, Once Saved, Always sa Saved. God says, if you endure to the end. We did an episode on that. We go through all the passages that I was aware of that cover these topics, and I put it out there. You go read it, and you, you let the Holy Spirit convict you with God's Word, and you decide. But I know that once you read it, you're going to be convicted, because you cannot hold to a belief that contradicts God's Word. Now, here, he tells these people, tell me, you who want to be under the law. Now, ironically, he's speaking to people who had already received the Spirit of God through faith. How do they go from faith going backwards? Now, this is a very perplexing thing. I haven't really seen this happen a lot. I think this is probably more so with them, um, but less so with people today. But it shows the possibility of a reality of things that happen. Now, from the standpoint of traditions, I don't think it happens that much. But then he's going to talk about sin. And that's going to come up in verse 5. Some people fall back into sin, just as Peter discusses in 2 Peter chapter 2, I believe, where he talks about people who have escaped the defilements of the flesh through the knowledge of Jesus Christ, who have become partakers, and then it says they fall back into that which they were once freed. It says it's worse for them than that they had never known the way of Christ, right. than to know it and then turn back to the world. He says it's like the dog going back to the vomit and the pig to the mud. But here, back in Galatians chapter 4, he says in verse 21, tell, tell me, me, go ahead, oh. tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, 
one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. Now, it's really interesting, right? One by the slave woman and one by the free woman. Now, the issue isn't so much the slave woman or the free woman, only God set it up this way. The real issue here is the son by the slave woman was through works of the law or works of man. The son of the free woman had nothing to do with the work of man because it was impossible. Did you catch that? It was impossible. Yeah. God had to intervene. She was over, she was in her hundreds, very God, old. The spirit, her womb was closed. The spirit of God, just like the 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 the, the, the virgin, virgin birth. Christ, yep. The virgin birth of Christ. It says in Luke that Jesus is called the Son of God because he was born by the Holy Spirit of God, conceived by the Holy Spirit of God. We were all called to be sons of God too when we are born again the second time by the Holy Spirit of God. Until we're born by the Holy Spirit of God, we cannot be sons of God. But when we are born of the same Holy Spirit of God as Christ is, we are then also also called sons of God. Jesus calls us brethren. Therefore, he's not ashamed to be called as his brethren. We are now the bride of Christ, joined to Christ as children of God. But as you keep reading, he says, verse 23, but the son by the bondwoman was born according to what? To the flesh. Because remember, it was through Abraham's effort. It didn't require the power of God. No. But the son of the free woman was born how? Through promise. Through promise. But Kyle, it's, it's not just the promise. There's so more to that, as we covered earlier. The promise was it, was, it was born according to a promise of God that was impossible. That was impossible. It required faith. It required Abraham to reject his, his faith in God that didn't demand the power of God, to then accept a faith in God that demanded the power of God. You see, this is the faith that I didn't know, Kyle. The faith I first first accepted in Christ, I still, even though I, I didn't know it because I, I was so deceived, I would have said, of course I'm not. I'm, I'm of the faith of, of the promise. I'm of the faith of, of Sarah, of, of Isaac. No, Kyle, I was a faith of Ishmael. It was my own work, even though I thought it wasn't my work. I thought I had faith in God, but it didn't demand the power of God. I didn't come to God and say, oh, when I, when I accept faith and I believe in Christ, I'm going to be freed from all sin. Not just the forgiveness and the penalty of sin. I am going to be freed. God is going to cleanse and remove every speck of leaven inside of me. I am going to be a completely holy vessel that he will then be able to fill me by his Holy Spirit through the blood of Christ to then walk in the nature of God, to be holy as God is holy in all of my behavior. Not some of my behavior, not part of my behavior, all of my, beho all my behavior, just as God commands in 1 Peter. How? Holy how? As God is holy. Just as it says in 1 John, if we walk in light as God himself is light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus' the Son cleanses us, from, cleanses us from all sin. As God is light, God has no darkness in him. Kyle, And, and, and it, gives, it gives another, uh, I guess it gives a stronger meaning and understanding when Nicodemus and Jesus were talking in John chapter 3. When when Nicodemus was was perplexed about having to be born again, he didn't understand that. He and, didn't, and that's actually the conception that still a lot of folks have no idea and what then it means. I, I thought I understood, like I understood ah, the concept. No, I know, and, I, and, and but that was me too. It was forty seven years. Like, well, yeah, I have to be born again by the Spirit, but I didn't know what it did. If you would have told me, so so the Bible talks about making us the first perfect man. I would have said, well, no, no, that's not perfect, or that's not possible, even though the Bible says it. You mean I can be completely freed from sin so I don't struggle with sin and all I do is overcome without trying? Yes, I would have said, can. I would have said, no, that's not possible because I didn't understand, Kyle. I didn't know any better. Nobody taught. All I was told is the forgiveness. Jesus died for the payment and the forgiveness of sin. That's only half of it. And he, they would say past, present, and future is what a lot of those guys would say. And, and actually, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, I think it's 915, that Jesus died for the sins committed under the first covenant, that we then become the holy high priest under Christ, priests with the high priest, that we now offer our lives as a holy living sacrifice, it's, just like Christ did, which is our spiritual service of worship. That's right. And we covered that through the entire book of Hebrews. And the book of First Peter, and and in Romans chapter 12, once it gets to the end of after who has been born into Christ. Amen. But Kyle, all these things come together. The problem is people aren't putting them all together with continuity. They Pick and pluck the verses that show the weakness, like the Corinthian church, which we, we talk about. Don't be like the Corinthians. Uh, hindsight's twenty twenty. When you actually go and look at it, many of them were uh, in danger. Many of them were frauds and arrogant, were still under the wisdom of man. Many of them were still infants, had not yet received the Spirit of God, were not sons of God. We cover this in that episode. If, if that's one of those that gives you, uh, you know, comfort and feeling of the, the Corinthian church, 
please, you need to listen to the episode. We did both two chapters, working backwards through it. Hindsight's twenty twenty. It will change your life. Now here, again. I, I just want to go add one more thing. Earlier on, we kind of passed by it, but it talked about, Paul had approached the thing about uh, miracles having been performed around them and them they themselves having experienced miracles of the Spirit. And and yet they want to go back to the works of the law. You know, it shocked him. Yep. So here, uh, Galatians chapter four, verse twenty-four. So again, the the son of promise and and the son of the uh, the slave woman. He says this is allegorically speaking, for the woman are two covenants. They're two covenants. Now, not only the two covenants, uh, there's so truth to this because not only is it representative with with Abraham and how he had his first son and then Abraham and how he had his second son that we already talked through. But it's also analogous and allegorically applied to uh, Israel in Mount Sinai and how they received the law from there and didn't understand. And we covered all that in Is Your Faith Based Upon Truth or Lies, part one and part two. Please, you have to dig into the Word of God and go deeper to understand these things. Don't listen to man. I say, don't listen to me. I want you to dig deeper into your Bible. That's what I want you to do. One proceeding from Mount Sinai bearing children who are slaves. She is Hagar. This Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia corresponding to present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. If you truly came in the faith that does an impossible work. Impossible work. And then you get into chapter 5. So chapter 5, it says, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, what must we do? Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Remember, so there's two two types of slaveries it's going to talk about here. Now, most people discount the first part of chapter 5 because they think, ah, traditions, Jewish traditions, I'm not a Jew, I don't practice that, it doesn't apply. The second part is sin, it applies to everyone. Now, the whole point with the traditions that's really important here, Kyle, is it talks about the possibility of what happens. Remember, there's no difference in Christ. We're all one. It doesn't matter if you're Jew, Greek, or Gentile, slave, free men, barbarian, Scythian, it covers it in Galatians, it says the same thing in Colossians, it doesn't matter. It's only one. Now, if a Jew can receive the Spirit of God, he doesn't receive the Spirit of God any differently than a Gentile. Correct. They both receive it through faith. If you receive the same promise through faith, if one can lose it, they both can lose it. That's it doesn't right. matter if you're a Jew and a Gentile. If a, Jew, Gentile can, a Jew can lose the Spirit, the Gentile can lose the Spirit. If a Jew can be grafted into the rich olive root or is a part of it, and they can be broken off, and you can be grafted in, the Bible even warns that you can be broken off too. That Jesus talks about that in John chapter 15. It's repeated in Romans chapter 11, specifically saying, you better fear, because if you don't continue, you will be broken off too. That's right. These aren't my words. These are the words of God. So here, he talks about well, what happens if you go backwards? Remember he talked about the danger of some of them going backwards that we covered in chapter 4? Well, here for the Jews, he says, if you go and you receive circumcision, does he say Christ will be benefit them? No. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. So if you go and you receive circumcision... You're obligated to keep the whole law. Then you will sever yourself from Christ... You who are seeking to be righteous by the law, you have fallen from grace. Now, people say, oh, no, that's not possible. Well, well, well there it is in The Bible words. just says it right there. You have fallen away you from grace. You will means sever it's yourself from Christ, and you will fall from grace. Now, this at the time was a problem for the Jews. If, and now he talks about other problems. Sin. Sin can come in. It ta- you know, and there's many uh, warnings. Again, if if you don't know what I'm talking about or if you disagree, then I challenge you. Your life depends on it. You need to listen to the episode we did, Once Saved, Always Saved, If You Endure to the End, and you need to open up your Bible. You need to dig deep into Scripture and pour over those books until God teaches you and reveals and convicts you by His Spirit what is the truth. But He says, we through the Spirit are, uh, and by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. What verse? Oh, that's verse 5. Okay. So in verse 7, again, he cautions them, he chastises them again. Does he say they were running well? Yeah, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Hmm. Uh, That persuasion doesn't come from God. Uh, A little leaven leavens a whole lump of dough. So it's a danger. Now, verse 13 now transitions. So the first part was traditions. Now the second part of freedom is sin. What does he say in verse 13 and 14? 
For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we cover what this means in Romans chapter 13, episode, verses 8 through 12, which to love your neighbor as yourself fulfills the law because when you love your neighbor as yourself, you no longer sin against them. When you don't sin against them, you fulfill the law. You don't break the law. You're actually no longer under the law. But if you still bite, devour, you have conflicts, you have quarrels and conflicts, as James talks about in verse 13, that's a wisdom of the world, that's demonic, well, then you don't have the wisdom of God. He says, take care that you're not consumed by one another. In verse 16, Kyle, if you're being led by the Spirit, is it even possible to carry out the desire of the flesh? No. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Right, it's not possible. The Spirit only produces one kind of fruit. For you the see, they're The desires opposites. of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. That's right. And so when we, we come under the Spirit, we get all new desires. The old desires are completely dead. And now I understand it. You understand it. Before, we would have argued our... Well, you did. You argued against me, and I argued against yeah. God for a year yeah. before I finally submitted it. And praise God, once you did, bam, the power of God released. Yeah. But now he says, what's the only way to no longer be under the law? In verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And that's the whole point. Remember, when you're led by the Spirit, it's no longer you trying. It's the Spirit doing. You become right. a doer of the law, not a hearer. That's right. Um, so now he's going to tell us. He's like, well, there's a difference. Here's how you know if you're under the Spirit or if you're still under the law or the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, if you've done one, you've done all. If you're guilty of one, you're guilty of everything. We covered that in James. It doesn't matter. It's co it, That's repeated in many different books. But Kyle, is the fruit of the Spirit different? Does the fruit of the Spirit consist of any of those things? Uh, no, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Against those such things there is no law. Why would there be no law against those things? Because those fulfill the law. Because those fulfill the law. They are fulfillers of the law, and that's what people don't understand. And we talk more about what does it mean to fulfill the law and what Jesus taught and what God speaks through his word. What does it mean to be um, doers of the law and fulfillers of the law? That's in the episode, the new commandment is the old commandment, and God commands us to be doers of the law. You have to listen to that. So then he says, those who belong to Christ, in verse 24, have crucified the flesh. Now, it's not us that do it. It's actually, it's the Spirit of God that does it. Now, we get the benefit of it, but it's God that does it through faith. It crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. So if we live by the Spirit, then we must walk by the Spirit. This is the truth of God. So why don't we go ahead and close in prayer and give glory to God. Amen. Father, I thank you, O God, as you continue in Galatians 6, you tell us and you warn in chapter 6, verse 7, do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will reap. For the one who continues to sow to his own flesh, then from the flesh he'll reap corruption. But it's the one who sows to the Spirit that will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Therefore, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Father, I thank you that all that matters is that we are a new creation, that the only thing that we would boast would be in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to us and we have been crucified to the world. Now, we know that that's only true if the, if the Holy Spirit has truly entered a person's life. We also know there's a difference between works of the law and works of the Spirit. We know that works of the law versus faith is about how do you receive the Spirit of God, but the Spirit of God does something so much greater. The question is, what faith did we come in? A faith that can save or a faith that cannot? A faith that was not for perfected, a faith that Abraham had that was under the promise that could not bear spiritual life, but the covenant of condemnation, the promise of the slave woman, Hagar, because prophecy hadn't been fulfilled, because Abraham's faith hadn't been perfected. He still had a faith that didn't believe in the impossible work of God until he was rebuked by God. And then God tested him to know what was in his heart to see if now he truly had a faith. And when he obediently obeyed, his faith was perfected. 
and it was made perfect, and he was declared righteous, or he was now righteous before God. Father, I pray that your word will convict people. I pray that people will go back and they'll meditate and they'll pour over your word. And I pray that they will not try to justify what they've been taught all these years, but they will in humility submit to your word, O God, appeal to you and beg on their knees that your spirit would teach and open their eyes to understand and that all your word will exist in harmony as it supports itself. Be glorified, O God, in our lives through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We hope this weekly program helped rekindle your zeal to know, love, and serve Christ day by day. If you enjoyed the program, consider subscribing and sharing with your friends. Thanks for listening.